from Portland, Oregon. This is GovLove, a podcast about local government. GovLove is produced by ELGL, the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. We engage the brightest minds in local government. I'm Kirsten Wyatt, a fellow at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, and I'm also the ELGL co-founder. Today, I'm joined by Justin Elsatz, the Chief Data Officer for the City of Baltimore, Maryland. Justin, welcome to GovLove. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Today, we'll talk about Justin's work in Baltimore, the city's new digital service team, and the innovative work that Justin and his team are doing to introduce data analytics to the whole city organization. But first, as always, we'll get started with a lightning round. What is your most controversial, non-political opinion? You know, I've I've thought a lot about this one. (laughs) Um, I'm not a beach person. I I don't like the beach. Um, It's it's a little hot it's too much sunlight if i'm gonna want if i want to read a book i don't want like the blazing sun on my back um yeah i i I don't do beach (laughs) i mean i feel like maybe we should have you out here to the oregon coast where you can kind of still get the like scenery but you just never sit outside (laughs) yeah i'd love it (laughs) (laughs) all right Don't get me wrong. I love being outside. It's just the beach. I love being outside. I love the Pacific Northwest. That's the beach that I I, I can't get into. Got it. Okay. Well, well, we're with you. We'll support you in that. Um, Next question. What book are you currently reading and do you recommend it? Yeah, I could spend a whole, whole podcast talking about this. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I usually have two books going, a nonfiction and a fiction. I just finished Cormac McCarthy's new book, The Passenger. Um, I'm oh. a big McCarthy fan. I uh, mm-hmm. this one was I. It was a little baffling to me. Um, okay. There were definitely some big themes, but I couldn't quite get what the point was. Um, okay. Nonfiction. I just finished uh, Atlas of AI by Kate Crawford. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a lot of um, research and thinking about ethical and responsible AI, especially as it applies to, to city services and government. Um, mm-hmm. So that was that was a really good one. It was much deeper and more, I think, a little bit more connected and grounded to, you know, philosophy and ties a lot of strings together. Um, and mm-hmm. I really appreciated that one. There, there are a whole series of books out there now on AI. Um, so those are the two I just, just finished. And, and yeah, but all, like I said, I always have couple of books going. <laughs> What's your favorite McCarthy book of all time? Um, yeah, I mean, th- it's it's hard to not. Uh, but Blood Meridian is is like it's a it's a milestone book, I think, in American literature. Um, it is incredibly violent, but um, yeah, it's it's another one with a lot of big, big themes and a very, very weighty book. Um, but I also did love the road. Um, okay. I recommend the road to to parents. Um, it is um, there, there's something incredibly um, universal and um, primal about you know the the way you you want to protect and keep your kids close, and the road just really <laughs> really goes hard on really goes hard on that. Um, you know, by the end I was, I was in tears and, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, the road, the road's an excellent, excellent story. All right. And shifting gears to music, what was the first music purchase that you made independently and what format was it on? (laughs) Yeah, I had to think about this one and I don't want this to be a sign of what I currently listen to. I think, (laughs) I think this would have been 1994. So I was, I would have been what, eight or eight or nine years old. Um, it was Ace of Bass on cassette tape. (laughs) Yeah. Was it the full, was it the full album or did you just buy like the sign single? (laughs) No, it wasn't the single. It was, it was, it was the album. Um, for some (laughs) reason it sticks in my head that there was a song in, that they sung in French, I think. Oh. Um, I should have looked this up before the interview, but I think there was a song in French. So you kind of, yeah. Buying it. And played it for my grandmother, who I think spoke some French and was asking her like what some of the words were. But <laughs> I mean, I don't remember any of it now. But 
made you even more worldly as a, as a music listener. <laughs> <laughs> right, something like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Um, start off by telling us about your career path. Sure, yeah. Um, so my background, um, I, I started off in mechanical engineering and, and really had a, a deep interest in aerospace. And so my undergraduate degree was in mechanical engineering. I did co-ops and internships in the in the aerospace field. Um, when I graduated, um, and that said, like I always had an interest in, you know, I, at that time, this would have been 2008, um, data science, the term hadn't even been coined yet. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't have a way of connecting, you know, my technical skills and interest with some of the, you know, social, I would say social justice issues that I, and, and policy that I really cared about. Um, I just thought that those were kind of two separate and distinct worlds at the time. Um, so after college, I got a job um, designing medical instruments. Um, so this was spine implants and instruments um, mm. in, in the medical device field. Decided, all right, maybe I need to, you know, and as so many folks do when they when they get two years into their new career and decide it's not for them, they decide to go to grad school. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to grad school. This was still in mechanical engineering, um, but I started that's where I started to think, okay, the energy sector is somewhere where I could combine some of my social concerns with, and policy concerns with, with my technical skills. Um, getting into the energy sector, doing research um, there as, as part of graduate school led me into data science. So using data to understand energy usage patterns um, in the residential sector. Um, mm -hmm. After that, I, I started a PhD, dropped out of the PhD program, um, did a couple, you know, went into consulting at that point and never really had an interest in consulting per se, but the majority of the, the work I did was with the, um, was actually with the U S department of energy and their appliance standards program. So, uh, mm. under the Obama administration, that was one of the really key levers that the administration used to, um, basically save, save carbon emissions and reduce energy consumption. Um, they really pushed mm -hmm. manufacturers of appliances and buildings to improve their efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously when the two, 2016 election happened that we, we all knew that was going to come to a halt for a while. Um, mm -hmm. So I managed, I managed some data science work uh, with that same consulting firm for a little while with um, energy utility companies, but um, and so I think it was through that work that I figured out that government public sector work was, was kind of the right fit for me because I could apply technical skills to, you know, policy and, and social concerns that I, that I was interested in. Um, uh, 2017 comes, uh, Baltimore gets, um, and by the way, this was down in DC and I was living in Baltimore. Um, okay. so, uh, 2017, um, Baltimore receives a Bloomberg Philanthropies grant to create an innovation team, and the role for data scientists comes up. Um, and I, uh, you know, apply and, and took a leap <laughs> yeah. uh, into local government, and really haven't looked back since. Um, it's, yeah. it's the ideal fit. Well, and, and such an inspiring career path, especially for any of our listeners who, you know, maybe have been government curious or know that they want more of a mission driven um, focus in their career that you can really start anywhere um, and, and take any career path and, and find a path into government. And so, you know, appreciate you sharing, sharing that with us. Um, would love to hear what you think the best thing is about working for the city of Baltimore. So since you made that leap and you haven't looked back, um, what are some of the things that, that make Baltimore as an employer stand out? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, city of ba working for city government in Baltimore, um, again, like I, I think I've always had kind of, um, you know, a, more of a, a social justice and, um, uh, you know, policy mindset. And mm -hmm. what is exciting for me is I think another aspect of, of learning 
throughout my career has been figuring out that, and another reason maybe I dropped out of my PhD program was that I'm, I'm more of a generalist than, than a specialist. Mm -hmm. Um, and in Baltimore, and I'm sure this is the same in a lot of city governments, you just get to experience such a wide, wide variety of, of, of problems, um, that Mm -hmm. need attention. Um, and so getting to ask the question and be creative about, you know, what, what can data say about this problem? How do we bring, data to bear, what data can we even trust, um, you know, in certain areas. Um, that's, that's what keeps working in city government kind of fresh and interesting for me is that, you know, wait six months and there'll be a new challenge or a new problem, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's never the same. It's not, it's not by any means formulaic. Um, so that's, I think that's, at least for me personally, um, what kind of keeps me keeps me locked in um, to, to the work. And I think also, clearly you have a curious mind. I mean, you're reading in your spare time books about AI and thinking about the application of city government. Um, talk about how Baltimore has cultivated, you know, starting with the Bloomberg iTeams program and then now through um, the creation of your newest team, the digital service team. Um, talk to us about how that curiosity and that, that real interest in how cities work and how we can get better um, is part of your life. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, good, good question. Um, uh, asking the right questions, you know, I, I think, <laughs> I think growing up, you know, so many of us are told like there's no bad question and don't be afraid to ask questions. And for whatever reason, I kind of naively took that to heart. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> And, um, you know, haven't, haven't been afraid to ask questions. And, and I, I think, and it, and it seems to me um, over time, more and more people have become comfortable asking questions um, and, um, you know, not, not shying away from power dynamics or, mm-hmm. um, you know, feeling like they have nothing to, to contribute to the conversation. I think, a lot of people, you know, I I think a lot of people are coming around to the fact that everyone has a voice and everyone deserves to be able Mm -hmm. to ask questions. Um, and so that's, that's, like I said, I've, I've, of course, you know, the beneficiary of a lot of privilege. And so asking a question that might get me in trouble has never really gotten me in trouble. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I feel it's partly my responsibility to make sure that there is a safe space for asking those questions and encouraging others to, to ask tough questions and, and, um, propose ideas. Um, that, that's the only way we really move forward and, and, and change things. So if, if for nothing else, you know, set aside data and design and, you know, um, if, if, you know, what I can offer is just asking better questions and encouraging others to ask questions. I mean, I feel like that's, Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will be have been a, a worthwhile contribution. And it's it's interesting that you say that. Earlier this week, I did a GovLove um, interview with Marina Nitza, who wrote the book "Hack Your Bureaucracy." And you know, at its core, when you want to try to fix things that are deeply entrenched, you know, her advice is always to ask questions and to be curious. And so, you know, hearing it from both the macro perspective of the book that she wrote, and then you know your perspective here the work that you're doing, um, you know, so important and so true. So I appreciate you sharing that. You know, it's, it's, about so, your, oh, you, it's, it's really funny. You mentioned that book. Um, you, you know, you earlier asked, what are you currently reading? And I gave you what I had just finished reading. I'm actually currently reading Hack Your Bureaucracy. <laughs> Isn't it great? I mean, yeah. She's, yeah. She, that, that was a fun interview. So I'm glad that, that your, your interviews will go back to back, hopefully on God Love. Oh, awesome. Great. Yeah. Tell us more about the new team that you are building from scratch, from the ground up, the digital service team. Yeah, we're really excited um, to be building our, our, our digital services team. Because um, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, you've probably interviewed others and, and seen this in, in governments all across the country, these digital services teams popping up. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I think the latest, um, the latest cohort of innovation teams um, from Bloomberg Philanthropies adopts more of a, a digital model. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
so we're really excited to be to to be picking up this this best practice. I think it's an opportunity to one even even just to come to the aid of our um, IT agency and and mm-hmm. um, you know be able to to um, you know even just as added technology capacity. Really, there's there's no shortage of places where we we need to to change our approaches to to how we're managing workflows or providing services and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that this will, and by the way, our IT department has, has grown by leaps and bounds, um, you know, especially after 2019, we had a, um, a ransomware attack. Um, obviously mm-hmm. 2020 was, was COVID-19, which had large implications for, for technology and, and how we provide services. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited to be, to maybe help contribute to that. Um, mm-hmm. We have it's, it's a team of four. We're using ARPA funding to uh, initially fund it. Um, mm-hmm. So the mayor, you know, Mayor Brandon Scott here in Baltimore decided that this is this is, you know, of course part of a COVID response um, mm-hmm. that we need to be more flexible and quicker to, to adapt to changing needs on the ground and. Um, we're desperate to increase access to as many services as, as possible. So mm-hmm. uh, it's a real, I'm excited uh, to be building this team. Um, we currently have roles open for um, a lead developer, a UX designer, and a product manager. Um, we're about to announce, um, we're about to name our, our director for the team who will start in January, um, but definitely recruiting for those other three roles still. So um mm-hmm. I'm really looking forward to to see what this team can can build and deliver for residents here. And I'll put a quick plug in. Yesterday, Justin participated in our digital service network job fair. We have the presentation that he gave about the positions that they're hiring for, um, and we'll link to that from this episode as well. Talk to us about how your digital services team will interact or work with your data office, your IT department, your mayor's office, how do you envision all of these different um, departments or functions coming together to tackle these tough problems? Yeah, um, I think uh, it, it, it's a good question because I think it looks slightly different in every city um, and every mm-hmm. jurisdiction that stood up one of these digital services teams um, or or even when it just comes to analytics and data teams, it, it the shape it takes and where things are placed structurally and, and who the key stakeholders are, you know, it always tends to, to look slightly different in every city. And it's, um, I, I enjoy learning from others, what, it, what it looks like there and how it works and what we can, can improve here. Um, yeah. So the digital services team here will be, so my role chief data officer reports to the city administrator and the digital services team will be, um, um, under my direction, um, and so our, I report to the, the city administrator. He reports to uh, the mayor. Um, so definitely kind of be centrally in government, you know, in, in, in the mayor's mm-hmm. office. Um, obviously, there'll be a close collaboration with our IT de- department. Um, we want to be aligned in things like cybersecurity. Um, we want to make sure that we're building things that we're going to be able to sustain and maintain um, mm-hmm. and don't want to again, because, you know, we're still um, growing our IT capacity. Um, and, you know, as, as a lot of governments are experiencing, we're just under under constant, constant threat. And we don't want to, um, you know, we want to make sure we're, we're, everyone is comfortable what's, with what's being built. And we're doing it in a way that, that protects ourselves, mm-hmm. our information, our data. Um, so that's a, a really key alliance um, within the mayor's office. You've got teams like our Office of Performance and Innovation who do mm-hmm. uh, you know, our performance management. City Stat was kind of the original, um, yeah. the original performance management team in, in the U.S., um, our, our innovation team. I think I'm kind of interested in, in and again, it, it'll definitely depend on what the, what the project is. We've, we've been waiting for the team to come on um, to help identify and settle on which project we, we should take on. I think we have a long, mm-hmm. long menu of options for what we'd be, right. be potentially building. Um, but we want to hear from the, the team themselves once they're on board, what makes sense. But depending on what the project is, um, you know, I, 
in, in the design space, uh, our the digital services team will add a, a UX capacity, a mm-hmm. UX design capacity. Our innovation team has um, service design expertise. And so I think depending on what the project is and what the needs are, we, we may need to, to partner with the innovation team, you know, for that for that service design um, aspect. Um, yeah, so I, th- those are a couple of the the key players, and then obviously it changes depending on what the what the project is, um, yeah. you know, what the services we need to work on. Well, and, and what it sounds like is you know you've done your research, you've figured out the ways that other organizations have structured this function. And you're finding ways to, you know, break down those silos or those barriers and letting these teams, you know, work together to provide the very best service and expertise. So, um, you know, hopefully for our listeners, you're hearing this and are as excited as as we are about the fact that that Baltimore is taking this next step and is going to be doing some really great work. Um, what types of projects do you think? And I, and I know you said that you're waiting until you have the full team, but is there any kind of low hanging fruit type projects that you think the team's going to tackle? Um, and I'm asking this just to kind of further entice our listeners who might be interested in applying to think about the ways that they could immediately come in and make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. When I've been asked that question, either by candidates or other other kind of stakeholders who are getting interested in digital services, I, I tell a lot of folks that sometimes it's even easier to, to identify what might be the big blue sky <laughs> initiatives yeah. as opposed to the small, small quick wins. Yeah. Um, things like um, Seattle developed a, um, um, a multi-agency benefits application. So kind of a single port of entry for, for government yes. benefits. And I, I, I mean, it's squarely in line with reducing barriers to access, improving equity in our government service delivery. Um, it's, also would happen to be one of the more difficult <laughs> projects to take on. But I mean, yeah. that even, even citing that as an example of kind of a, you know, a North star for this team as to, you mm-hmm. know, this is how we want to be thinking. This is the kind of thing we, we want to, to, to build. Um, I think that's kind of a useful, like I said, kind of a useful North star. Another idea is, um, I talked with the chief technology officer at our library system um, and he threw out the idea of municipal IDs. Um, It's been Mm -hmm. talked about for a few years here in the city. um, And I know our mayor is is also still interested in the concept of having a municipal ID. I think that's something that that a digital services team could potentially contribute to. Um, The reason I I mentioned our our, the CTO at our library is he threw out the idea of using a, a library card as you know, a minimally viable product, mm-hmm. kind of a, a pilot card for for that. So pick one mm-hmm. or two services that you want to connect to your library card and you've got the beginnings of a municipal ID. Um, yeah. So like I said, th- th- those are com- kind of a couple of like example North Star <laughs> projects. Mm-hmm. You know, the smaller things, you know, I've, I've um, there's a there's a couple of things that have cr- popped up even even within the last, you know, a couple of weeks. Um, Special permitting with the Department of Transportation, I know, um, is is getting a look right now to to revamp that process mm-hmm. and digitize it. Um, I talked a while ago with our our chief equity officer about um, um, like a civil rights complaint portal. I think the federal mm-hmm. government might have built something like this, and mm-hmm. LA built a portal. I think it was actually specifically around sexual harassment in in city government. Um, mm-hmm. a portal to, to report abuses. And so, you know, there's, there's potential for, for something like that here. Um, yeah. And, and like I said, there's, there's a long menu of, of things yeah. you could possibly do. So it's, it's picking what's going to be right, you know, for a brand new team coming out of the gate to really get some traction and, and show the value mm-hmm. of the team. I love it. And I think sometimes too, having, you know, that possibility and then knowing that, there is the support of a team like this. It's, you know, that's that's enough for someone to, to get excited. So we'll make sure we link to the open job positions from the show notes um, from this episode as well. Cool. I'd um, love to shift gears and then talk about your Data Academy program. Tell us about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, our Data Academy program was um, 
creating a, a data training program for for city staff is actually a commitment that the that Mayor Brendan Scott made for for Baltimore, and you can find it in the mayor's action plan if you visit mayor.baltimorecity.gov. Um, our Office of Performance and Innovation built a, a tracker for the mayor's action plan, and it's like I said, it's it's one of the actions that the mayor committed to for his the, his first term of his administration. Um, so what we've done is we've been partnering with the Center for Government Excellence here at Johns Hopkins. We're really lucky to have them in our backyard. Um, mm-hmm. And their team has been helping us compile either pre-existing content from other courses they've designed, a- along with creating new content um, to create. Um, we, we've started with um, a handful of different tracks uh, for the Data mm-hmm. Academy. Um each one is, you know, four to eight hours total. It's at your own pace. Um, the 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 track that I think we we really want to push out and and are most excited about is um, we've called it fundamentals of data literacy. But it, so it's it's about um, it, it's geared towards folks who have kind of no background in in data mm-hmm. um, and who are. You know, we, we, we want to start building, we want to grow data capacity at every level of government. And so mm-hmm. for those frontline workers, you know, the DPW crews and the housing inspectors and the folks who may not have a whole lot of experience with data as, you know, as mm-hmm. quote unquote data per se, um, mm-hmm. helping them, you know, learn what, what are data? Why does, why do so many people care about it? Why is that what people talk about now? How does it show up in your life? Um, even touching on things like AI, um, Mm -hmm. how is it that Amazon is suggesting what I should buy or Netflix is recommending these movies to me? Um, Mm -hmm. so understanding, you know, how your interactions, you know, your digital interactions, you know, a lot of them become data and are used (laughs) after long after you, you, you know, turn your phone off for the night. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the initial tracks that we've we've been piloting um, and we're starting to scale it up a bit. But um, so that, that's one of the tracks. Like I said, there's um, three other tracks that we've identified to start off with. Um, the way we kind of identified them was really just understanding some of the needs of the of the agency. So I remember early on um, having interviews, talking to, to agency heads, even when I initially came into the role and trying to suss out what some of their needs and concerns were. Um, Mm -hmm. And then following that, you know, GovEx, Center for Government Excellence did, you know, more work of of talking to talking to staff and and agency heads here here in Baltimore to to find out, you know, if you had to, you know, if you had to pull one lever and try to make gains with using data in your agency in one space, where where might that be? And, And, you know, one area that came up is, is, you know, just Kind of basic data literacy so yeah really excited to be to be pushing that out there we we know that like we data scientists and data analysts in government um there, there's such a, a it's one of the great parts about being in data science is the is the open source community um mm-hmm. and, and everyone coming to one another's aid and being having so many even freely available online resources already existing um, right. So for our data scientists and data analysts, you know, if we can tell them, look, for the time being, you know, if, if you're looking to take a new skill, you know, take out, check out these couple of, of resources while we focus on building content for for folks who don't have that kind of pre-existing content. Um, right. You know, eventually, of course, we want to be able to design other tracks or, or build other supports for our analysts and data scientists. But right now, if, you know, folks are not in the data field don't really have mm-hmm. an entry point or, or may not know where, where to start. So that's, that's where we focused initially. What strikes me as well is you're giving everyone that baseline knowledge or understanding, which makes it, I would think, you know, somewhat easier to have a culture within the organization that that you value and use data to drive decision making and to understand, you know, tricky problems and then figure out how to solve them. It's not just, you know, allowing 
a certain group of employees to have that expertise or perspective, but you're really opening it up to everyone. Yeah, I, I look, that's definitely the long term goal. Um, I think we have a long ways to go. Um, we, mm-hmm. like I said, we're, we're piloting this. Um, you know, we want to get feedback. We want to, um, you know, have continuous surveys so that we understand what are the impacts. Are people learning? Are they using some of this knowledge? Um, so it's definitely a, a, a long term goal. It's one piece of kind of the data culture. Um, uh, puzzle. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still really hopeful about it. And um, yeah, definitely more to come on that front. And do you have any early, you know, feedback or, or um, um, response from employees about, about the program? Or is it still too early? It's pretty early. We, we have a little bit of feedback and it's been very positive. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. Um, it, it, like I said, it's, it's still a little bit early um, and we have, sure. We want to we want to scale up and get kind of feedback at scale to be sure, but the initial initial response has been positive. Good. And for a listener who's hearing this and they're thinking, you know, this sounds like a great idea, and they might want to take a next step or learn more or get started with something similar in their organization, any recommendations or resources that you would offer? Yeah, like I said, um, you know, the Center for Government Excellence has been so helpful on this. It's, it's a lot of their content and I've, I've, I've taken the credit, <laughs> I've, you know, I've, <laughs> I've steered and, and tried to make suggestions on like what some of our actual needs are in the city. Um, mm-hmm. But they've been a tremendous resource. So they've got, like I said, they've got existing content from the kinds of trainings that, that they already do. Um, mm-hmm. I do think, you know, what, what we've managed to add in terms of, you know, um, kind of the fundamentals of data literacy. I think that's a little bit new, um, but they have mm-hmm. so much existing content and knowledge on, on building data culture. So that's definitely a, an important resource. Um, I'm also happy to talk to folks about how we, how we, um, you know, how we've developed it, who we talk to. Um, but it's, it's as with all, as with all problems, um, I, was it Einstein who said like, you know, if you give me an hour to solve a problem, I'll spend the first 55 minutes defining the problem. Um, I think mm-hmm. that's the, defining the problem. Like what, what is it about, you know, data literacy or, or growing data capacity and culture? Um, what is it that you, you want to address? What is the specific problem? Um, I think the theory of change here for us is that, um, you know, building data literacy at, at kind of the frontline worker level um, you know, ha- will have knock-on effects in, in job satisfaction, in um, mm-hmm. productivity, um, you know, in career advancement. So um, we, we hope it's the start. That's 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 certainly the theory of change, and I think we have we have a little ways to go to, right. to prove it out to be sure. But but um, right. And, and you only get there by asking, <laughs> like, of course, it comes back to asking questions, right? So talking right. to agency heads, talking to people, you know, in, at various levels of your agency is like, what would be helpful? Um, mm-hmm. You know, what do you want to learn? What do you need to learn? What would make your life easier? What would make the agency perform better? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that always... Just about every <laughs> every time you try to solve a problem, it basically comes back to, to those questions. Right. And this is a little out of left field, but I can't help but ask. I mean, from some of your early inquiry and some of these questions that you're asking or what you're learning, are you seeing some gaps in the skills that your early career workers are bringing you know, to, to the workplace? I mean, are, is there a role that some of our, you know, MPA, MPP programs, or, or even undergraduate programs could play in getting our workforce to be more data literate or, you know, data ready as they enter organizations like the city of Baltimore? So you're talking like people with college degrees entering kind of like a professional career? Yeah, sure. I mean, let alone, you know, any other position, but I'm even just thinking about folks who, you know, who are graduating and want to you know, work and do innovative and creative things with governments, you know, are we training them appropriately? Yeah. Um, uh, 
That's a good question. Um, <laughs> and again, I just threw this one at you. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. it just, it makes me wonder, like, I mean, what you're doing is you're training everybody and that's, or, you know, you hope to. And I think, you know, and that's, and that's amazing, but not every organization is going to do that. And so what are, what can other entities be doing to, you know, ensure that the next person you hire doesn't have to start from scratch? Right. Um, I think I might, um, I think part of the answer to that question is actually less about what you're doing directly for, you know, an incoming, like you said, an MPA or, or, um, or a data analyst. Oftentimes what I'm finding is that it's what supports and what knowledge do the people they report to have around how to use data. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a lot of, so we created this data fellows program a couple of years ago, um, which gets early career um, data analysts into city government. The intent was always to establish a, you know, it's kind of a one year fellowship program. Um, and then we'll, you know, you would get kind of a more permanent um, um, spot in an agency. Um, mm -hmm. What we have found is that agencies know they can do more with data. They know they can maybe, and they know that they, there are things that they need to digitize um, mm -hmm. but they conflate that, they, they use that data fellow option as a way of getting someone to tackle some kind of data problem for them. And I, oh, interesting. I and while it's been, it's, it's certainly signaled a latent demand for data expertise because we like, we drastically underestimated the demand for that program. And a lot of agencies mm -hmm. kind of put their hands up and said, yes, we would want a data fellow, we'll, we'll even pay for our own. Um, wow. what, what we have found is that those data fellows don't always know what the next step in their career is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the agencies don't know what the next step is for, for, for that person. Um, oh, that's fascinating. And not only that, but, but the data fellows might, in some instances, the data fellows might say, I've, I've, I've worked on this thing, but it hasn't really taken hold. Or, you right. know, I came into this role thinking like, of course, being a data fellow that like I'd have data and I'd be analyzing it. But really what they asked me to do is like digitize this form or digitize this process. And I'm not necessarily cut out for that. Um, right. So what, what we, so this is a long way of answering that question, by the way. <laughs> But, no, this is fascinating. This is great. Yeah. So I, I, what what we need to do as an organization to make sure that those people coming in early in their careers, we, we need to be more nuanced and more educated about what it is we need out of data and technology. Um, mm -hmm. Part of that, and again, our IT department, BCIT, has, has also been making huge efforts on this front of you know, even, even just our job classifications. So the data fellow job classification was the first like dedicated data job classification. Of course, we have things like GIS analyst or, you know, mm -hmm. program analyst, that kind of thing. Um, but even just creating data analyst one, data analyst two, data scientist one. Um, right. Well, and not only that, but things like data engineer and, um, or machine learning and like getting really clear and nuanced about these roles mm -hmm. because they are nuanced in industry. And that's what the field right. is like. We need to build that structure in here and educate our agencies and match the right people and the right jobs to what the needs are in the agency. Um, mm -hmm. The default continues to be like, you know, oh, I've got a data need. I'll either hire a data fellow or this is something we should stat. So we're going to like create a performance management framework or stat it somehow. But um, mm -hmm. so getting our agencies to be more nuanced in what they need from what they need in data and technology, I think is, is, is going to help us is going to help those people coming into city government, you know, with a year or two of experience because our, our agents, we, agencies will have done their due diligence to 
understand what the need is and create the career mm -hmm. pathway for them. Um, as opposed to just the default of let's get someone in here who has some data skills. Um, right. Uh, so I, I think, I know that's a long winded answer, but I think that's a, that's, it's, it's a big part of make of, of coming to the data analysts aid um, because we've, mm -hmm. we've heard from data analysts that they don't have the right career pathway. They don't have an opportunity for promotion that, and of course, the like tried and true complaint of city government not paying enough. <laughs> um, sure. So we, we need to do a, a better job of, of matching agency needs to, to, to talent. Well, and, and it's a great answer because, again, this is precisely why having you on GovLove and having you talk about what Baltimore is doing is so important because I think we don't get those conversations started and we don't tackle those challenges, you know, in a vacuum all by ourselves. And it's when we're sharing what we're doing in our organizations, we're doing things as simple as sharing job descriptions or sharing business plans that we're able to, you know, find new ways, you know, to move forward and to modernize um, some of this work. So I appreciate you, um, you know, sharing that and as well as just the larger, bigger picture of, of how you and IT and digital services innovation are gonna be working together um, you know, in the coming years. So thank you for, for joining us. Would love to hear more about what you have planned um, in 2023. What's um, on your um, professional lineup or plans um, for the year ahead? Yeah. Um, so by the way, Kirsten, do you, do you, do you have an estimate of when this might come out? Because that might change my answer. <laughs> um, I think it'll come out like first week of January. It'll come out, uh, it'll come out within the month. Okay. I think we're safe then. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So one of the big areas I'm, I'm exploring, and like I said, when I was, when I mentioned what, what I've, I've been reading lately, <laughs> um, um, AI isn't coming, it's here, right? Um, right. Whether it's, it's, you know, automated vehicles. Uh, I was playing around with um, chat GB. GPT earlier today, um, asking oh, okay. a bit of inane questions, um, but also also for city governments, we we know there are tremendous opportunities. This this past summer, our housing department and I partnered with um, the Data Science for Social Good group at Carnegie Mellon to mm -hmm. use our aerial imagery to detect mm. um, to detect collapsed rooftops. So back in January. So Baltimore is kind of like, yes, we have a vacant, vacant building problem. We have about 15,000 buildings, 14,000 buildings in the city that have um, vacant building notices on them. And back in January of last year, we had three, I'm sorry, January of 2022, we had three firefighters killed um, in the line of duty when a, when a, um, a fully involved um, uh, vacant building collapsed on them. And mm. so there was an immediate need to, again, once again, and this is a perennial problem here is dealing with vacants, but it's, it's reached a, a, a real turning point here that, that everyone is, is kind of um, on high alert to do something about this. And so we asked like, you know, what might data contribute? Um, and so, yeah, so we, we've, we've, we partnered with uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, we've, They've developed kind of some initial modeling to use our aerial imagery um, to generate, you know, like I said, it, 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 it's a, a, a pattern, you know, an image classification tool that detects whether we think a building has, um, has a collapsed roof on it or not. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another application of AI showing up in city government already. Um, that's fascinating. But there are, but we know that there are some serious risks here. We know privacy, transparency, and bias are some of the, the, you know, kind of the, you know, the triumvirate of, of mm -hmm. dangers when it comes to, when it comes to AI. So we're thinking a lot about that. We, it, it's, it's looking like we're going to pursue something on that front. We have a, mm -hmm. a councilman Burnett here in Baltimore um, introduced and sponsored a, a facial recognition ban about a year and a half ago, and that's set to expire mm -hmm. at the end of at the end of this year. So there's already precedent and interest in doing something about it. 
Um, mm -hmm. We want it, but what I'm interested in doing is is using the opportunity to expand beyond just facial recognition and seeing what we can do, and at least starting mm -hmm. the discussion around what is the role of AI in government. What do our residents want? What do our residents feel comfortable with? Um, right. And making sure we have the appropriate guardrails in, in place. Um, because right. like I said, there, there are definitely advantages to it. There are places where we want to use it, but there are even more places where, well, first of all, we don't have the data quality to be able to, to, to take advantage. But, you know, right. of course, you know, number two is, 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 you know, just the, the risks involved and the potential to exacerbate inequity and, and um, mm -hmm. disparity here in Baltimore. So that's, that's something that's on my mind. And I'm, I'm like I said, I, I think we're going to be kind of moving in that direction in 2023 and having that conversation here. Well, it sounds like another topic to have you back on another episode of GovLove, um, maybe as we head into the year. Um, to check in and, and hear how that's going. Because I know that that will be of interest to many of our listeners. Um, uh, the second, well, you're welcome back anytime. Um, and But I do have to ask you our second to last question that we always ask our guests. Why local government? Why do you work in public service at the local level? I, I cannot think of another. I know impact is such a cliche word. <laughs> it's it's no. the word that probably gets you know, I, I bet you if you went back through your interviews and tried to figure out what is the word that all that most frequently comes up <laughs> in this question, it's probably <laughs> it's probably impact. Um, look, I, I, like it's it's not just impact per se, but it's it's tangible, direct um, impact that that you can feel. I mean, like I described my you know my in my former job. Um, it's definitely having large impact. I was working on appliance standards for for um, for appliances that go into buildings all across the U.S. And you know the the time scales and the the scales that we were looking at were thirty year time frames of how much how many met, you know how many tons of CO two and and mm -hmm. how many kilowatt hours of energy are we saving over the over that thirty year time span. So certainly had scale in terms of impact, but, you know, that's, that's all based on calculation and, and data. And for being a data person, you know, I'm, I think I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty emotional and pretty um, mm -hmm. attached to, to, you know, um, solving problems that, that will directly impact people's lives. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, I can't think of another environment besides local government that that would that would trump it in terms of, of um, in, in terms of that. Well, and that's a beautiful answer. And and you know, while I think you're right, you know, that people do often mention impact. I think you know it's also just putting that emotion behind it. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you could share that with us. A little less deep of a question, but still our traditional ending question for interviews. If you could be the GovLove DJ, what song would you pick as our exit music for this episode? And if you pick Ace of Bass, we're going to know that you are lying at the top Absolutely. that you didn't want that music to define you. So, so take it away. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, well, as a longtime GovLove podcast listener, I've I've thought long and hard about this question. Um, the song I'm going to go with, so we, we all, you know, I think, again, part of why we work in local government is that we, we try to be the change we want to see in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, along those lines, my song is a deep, deep cut from Bobby Brown off the Ghostbusters 2 soundtrack. It's called On Your Own or On Our Own um, by Bobby Brown. So um, look it up. That's that's the track I'm going out on. And I hope it uh, I hope it I hope people find it motivational. Perfect. Well, and again, I, I don't think we've ever had a pick from the Ghostbusters soundtrack on GovLove, so um, you can say that you're being innovative just in and of that song choice. Look, so, there was, uh, there's, so, there's never, there was no other good reason to have a Ghostbusters soundtrack pick for <laughs> the GovLove podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to happy to fill that niche. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on GovLove. Thank you. It's been uh, it's been a great conversation. I appreciate it. 
GovLove is produced by a rotating cast of ELGL volunteers. ELGL is the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. You can reach us on Twitter at GovLove Podcast or ELGL50. And if you'd like to be involved with the new network that we're building at the Beck Center in partnership with U.S. Digital Response, the Digital Service Network, please visit us at beckcenter.georgetown.edu. We are a growing peer learning network that supports an open, collaborative, and nimble network of government leaders who use technology, data, and design to improve and innovate public services. Thank you for listening. This has been GovLove, a podcast about local government.